Look down at uh, Acts chapter 28 and let me get you there. Um, do you know that somebody said, why, why are you all dressed up? What's the occasion? The occasion is it's Sunday and we're at church. Um, but, but no, we, we've always, we, we're, we're, all, we're kind of a casual church. I have a friend named Isaiah who plays for Nebraska Cornhuskers and he sent me a bow tie. And when your friend sends you a bow tie and he plays football, right, you, you wear, um, and I don't know, I'm kind of a, if you give a mouse a cookie dresser, if you put a bow tie on, you got to put a jacket. Anyway. Uh, now that made any sense, but look down at, at uh, Acts chapter 28 and, I'll, and, and I'll, I'll get you there. Ever feel hindered in your walk with God, hindered in sharing the gospel? Hinder, it's like every time I try to go on mission for God, boom, there is something in my way. Every time I try to share the gospel, boom, there's something in the way. The reason you feel that way is because something's in the way. Uh, it's not just your imagination. We fight against real forces of spiritual darkness, hindrances that are real, uh, a demonic force that hates the gospel. And you are constantly, when you are serving God, hear me, it is easier not to serve God than to move with God. There's some attitudes you've got to have in order to move with God. Um, so every time you're going to take on a project for God, you're going to hit new roadblocks, new, new barriers. Um, but here's the good news. God works best. Would you agree with this? God works best against hindrances. Um, God, am I right? God, God works well when pressed against a Red Sea. God works well in a lion's den. God works well in uh, a fiery furnace. And we could kind of go all day down that line. Am I right? That's just kind of where... Uh, and so if you're like, wow, I'm in a fiery furnace, smile, that's where God does some of his best work. If you're like, man, I feel like I'm in the lion's den, you are in good company, and it's not just the, uh, the lions. John Bunyan, uh, year, you know, one, of the, one of the reformers, his preaching so irritated the people of his day, they threw him in prison. They were like, we can't shut you up. They threw him in, in prison. Bunyan, this is the 17th, uh, 17th century England. Uh, Bunyan preached so well, though, that the prisoners would come out in the courtyard to hear him preach. But not only would the prisoners come to, uh, to hear him preach, the citizens of Bedford began, shut, get this, they showed up at the jail to hear Bunyan preach. Now, that's kind of incredible when people are just showing up at jail like they're crowding around the jail and Bunyan would stand in the courtyard and he would preach the God. And that's how magnetic the gospel is, pressing against religion, pressing against the church itself that said, we want you to shut up. He would stand in the courtyards of the prison and he would preach Jesus Christ crucified. He preached the grace of God. He, and as he's preaching, that magnetic gospel is drawn drawing people to a prison. They're like, we can't shut this guy up. We can't even impress. What they did is they took him and they locked him up inside the inside of the inside cell. Know what I'm saying? They were like, we will shut you up. And he, they may have shut his preaching up, but he started writing. And what he wrote would become a Christian classic. It, for a while, it was the most translated book next to the Bible in all the world. He started writing a book called Pilgrim's, ever heard of this? Called Pilgrim's Progress. You have heard of this, right? Um, it, it's, I don't know, it's about 80,000 pages long. So, um, he, hey, he was in jail a, a long time. Uh, but here's the amazing thing. As great as his preaching was, that book touched even more people. I love the way that when put against hindrance, God said, that's not a hindrance. That's really not going to be a, a problem for me. What I want to do today is just uh, wrap up where we've been actually all year long in the book of Acts. I wanted to cover two big sections of Acts. Uh, first, we looked at the early church and the expansion of the early church, and then at the missionary journeys of Paul. But the book of Acts ends with a single word that is like, I don't, it's like dynamite. It is just explosive. But first, um, can I get you there? Let me just kind of get you to that. That you're like, we're going to one word. Yeah, one, one word. Um, when I was a kid, this time I'm going to get you there. When I was a kid, I learned my Bible listening to what we called Bible tapes. And uh, don't judge me, I was four, okay? Uh, and I would listen to these Bible tapes over and over and over and over. And I realized actually the first time I read the book of Acts, it was on 
see tape or these, never mind. Uh, it was on, it was on, but let me just kind of take that second or that final stretch of the book of Acts and show you this, just kind of like pretend you're listening to, to Bible tapes. Uh, Paul goes to Jerusalem. When he goes to Jerusalem, there is a riot in Jerusalem. What happens so often is that when Paul preaches the gospel, it's like Bunyan preaching the gospel. It's like, uh, it, it's, it, it, it is that power of the gospel itself that when he preaches the gospel, it stirs people up and there is this riot. The Jews are violent. The uh, Romans come riding in. They save him from being killed. Um, he has brought them before the Jewish council to answer for his belief in the resurrection of the dead. Go, why does Paul believe in the resurrection of the dead? Because Jesus rose from the dead. That's why he believes it. It's, it's the, the fact of, of truth. He speaks to the Jewish council who should all get converted, but instead they get violent. Once again, the Romans come riding in and they, they've got to save him. And the Jews start to realize, wait, wait, wait. The Romans are never gonna figure out why this guy is a problem. So we need to kill him ourselves. There are 40 men, while well, he is um, imprisoned in Jerusalem, there are 40 Jewish men who take a vow, we're not gonna eat until Paul is dead. And uh, the word uh, kind of trickles out, it gets to Paul's nephew. Paul's nephew goes to the centurion that's in charge. And he tells him, hey, there's 40 men. They're going to kill Paul. It is an incredible scene. Uh, they escort this little Jewish man. Uh, they got to get him out of Jerusalem and over to Caesarea where he can be tried. They move him. You talk about armed forces. There are 200 soldiers come riding out to defend. There's just protect this one. Uh, they've got 70 horsemen. They've got Paul on a horse. They've got 200 spearmen. I mean, the Romans come out in force just to move him to Caesarea. That begins just a series of trials for Paul. Uh, Paul is going to be tried by one, uh, one court after another. He goes to Caesarea where he stands before Governor Felix, uh, who's hoping for a bribe, never gets it. So he just, one of the most discouraging verses in the Bible, I think it says, Paul was in prison for two years. Next verse, like two years of his life, just sitting in, in prison, waiting, for, wait, waiting to be tried. Then in uh, about AD 57, he goes to trial before emperor or um, the, the case is sent to, to the judge who's named Festus. Um, the, when the Jews come to actually bring charges against Paul, they can't think of anything he actually did wrong, which creates a problem for the Romans who like things like, you know, law and order. Um, so the governor though, he kind of wants to play nice to the Jews, but he realizes they've got no case. So he says this, how about I just move your case back to Jerusalem? Well, the Jews are like, yeah, send him to Jerusalem, we'll kill him. And Paul realizes, whoa, 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 my life's on the line here. There is no way I want to go back over there and be tried over there. And he suddenly looks at the judge and he says, aren't I standing in Caesar's court right now? I appeal to Caesar. I want, you do not send me back to Jerusalem, send me to Rome. That determines the course of the rest of his life. In fact, uh, Festus says this. He, he says, to Caesar, you've appealed. To Caesar, you'll go. It is then the job of the Romans to move him from Caesarea to uh, Rome. They get on a boat and uh, encounter as they're just trying. All they got to do is move this guy from one country to another. Across. The problem is there's a sea between them. And they are going to hit a storm as I, I thought it was interesting, the Romans don't have a boat, they hire sailors. And so they all get on the boat, off they go, and they hit, I kid you not, a storm of biblical proportions. You say, what makes it biblical proportions? Two things, number one, it was big. Number two, it's in the Bible, biblical proportions. Um, <laughs> that's deep, pastor. Hold on, look down there, uh, Acts chapter 27, verse 20, describes the severity of the storm. Luke says, we didn't see sun and we didn't see stars. All we saw 24 seven was dark. He says this, no small tempest lay on us. That means it was rough sailing. All hope of our being saved was abandoned. In the midst of this, everybody's about to give up. Paul gets up and he starts encouraging the sailors. He says, I had a vision. I'll read it to you. He says, this is Acts 27 verse, what's that, 24. He says, do not, this is what the angel said to Paul in the storm. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, 
God has granted you all those who sail with you. Now he says to the men, so take heart, men. I have faith in God. Well, what happens is on the other side of that storm, they just shipwreck into an island. The island is called Malta. And they go up on Malta. Uh, Luke notes that the, that the inhabitants of the island are unusually gracious. That's Acts 28, verse 2. Uh, the, the islanders are unusually gracious. They go up there. There's the, there's the sailors. There's the Romans. There's the prisoners. As Paul is going to move some wood, he picks up the wood, and a viper not a sidewinder, a viper. A viper comes out and latches to him. The islanders see him with a snake stuck to him. I think that's terrifying right there. That is one of the scariest stories in all the Bible because I like snakes. Um, <laughs> anyway, they see this, this snake just holding on to Paul and he goes and he shakes it into the fire. And they go, ah, this is all the islanders. They go, he must be a murderer or something bad. He escaped justice in the courtroom only now to be spread. They're like, look how life has turned. But then Paul doesn't get sick. So they change their idea. They go, maybe it's not he's a murderer. Maybe he's a god, which I think is hilarious. They're like, they, they can't decide. Is, is, he, is he terrible or is he great? Um, he is taken then to the home of the guy that runs the island. Uh, and th th it was interesting to me, the guy's father has dysentery. So why did, that excited me. Say why, because um, you gotta be a certain age to get this, but when I was in school, we played this game called Oregon Trail. And I was just glad to find dysentery in the Bible there uh, and find out that apparently what you needed on the Oregon Trail was you needed the Apostle Paul who prayed and cured this guy of dysentery. Uh, and then all the people start coming out and they're being, being healed by, by Paul. Finally, they get a new ship, they head in and they go to Rome. Paul has arrived where he said at one point, I appeal to Caesar. Now he is prepared to stand before Caesar's court. Uh, this is about AD 58. Look down there at Acts 28, verse 16. When we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself. This is like an introvert's dream. Yes! With the soldier who guarded him. No! Who's also chained to him? That is not staying by yourself. I love how people come to him. Uh, he meets the church in Rome that he's written a letter to from Corinth. Uh, the Jews come to him. He preaches to them. They have no idea what the charges against him are. Look down there at verses 30 to 31, and this is how Acts ends. Paul lived in Rome for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, literally, it says, the next line says this, with all boldness and acolusi. So that didn't excite, excite me at all, but it should. It just means with all boldness and unhinderedly. Your translations do a lot to kind of clean that up because unhinderedly is not a word for us, but it is in the Greek. It is just this active. What, is, what, what does Luke mean when he says unhinderedly? Can I, can I just kind of suggest? Because that's how the book ends. It just ends suddenly with all boldness and unhinderedly. What's that mean? What, what does Luke mean when he suddenly ends a book with the word unhindered? Certainly it means spiritually. That Luke looks back and he says, wow, we were moving with God. When, uh, when we went to Jerusalem, when we went to Asia, when we went to Europe, and we saw all these people converted. We saw people raised from the dead. It was not Paul at work. That was the unhindered hand of the Lord moving through us. Don't go worshiping Paul. That was the unhindered, nothing, no, in fact, it's almost like Paul or Luke would say, hey, I watched and nothing could hinder the gospel. I saw storms and I saw snakes. Oh boy, did I see snakes. I saw mobs and nothing hindered us because it was the work of the Lord. I also think they just means immediately. Right there, right then in that little house, even though Paul is chained to a guard under house arrest, Luke's comment is, yeah, he might be under arrest. And he might be confined to a house and there might be a Roman guard. Hey, can I tell you something? Paul wasn't chained to the guard. The guard was chained to Paul. 
24-7, all the guards hear about is Jesus, 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 Jesus. And it's like he pauses and says, you know what? Paul was never hindered. Is this true that sometimes it's in the times of greatest hindrance when it seems like everything should be against you? Often those are the times that God uses you the most. It's the people that you think would be most hindered. Uh, if you know of a lady named Johnny Erickson, uh, I think it's Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, she's in a wheelchair. God uses this, uh, this woman in a wheelchair to touch thousands and thousands of people. Uh, there was a guy, I don't know what happened to him. There was a guy named David Ring. He has cerebral palsy, and he's, a, he's an evangelist. Incre- isn't that incredible? You say, hey, you could never get over a hindrance of being a quadriplegic. You could never get over the hindrance of, um, of having cerebral palsy. But you've got an unhindered God. I also think, can I suggest this? I think it also, it's almost like Luke ends. And there's another way that that word kind of stands out to me, and that's prophetically. And that is, Luke ends with the word unhinderedly because Acts is unfinished. There's more of the story of the church to come. And it's like he looks at us and he says, hey, don't worry, guys. Nothing's gonna stop the gospel. In the next hundred years, there would be 10 successive waves of Roman persecution against the church. It would start with Nero, who would, that would just limited to Rome, mostly Nero's persecution. He would take uh, teenage kids that were worshipers of Jesus, impale them, put them on the wall, cover them in pitch and light them on fire to, to light his parties. He hated Christians. Uh, After him, you had Domitian, who would exile Christians, probably uh, the emperor who exiled the the, uh, apostle John. He tortured Christians. He would crucify Christians. He boiled them in oil. You had an emperor by the name of Diocletian who went after Christians in North Africa, cut out their tongues, boiled them in oil. He uh, so persecuted Christians. In fact, Christianity got so small, they erected a pillar in the middle of Rome during Diocletian's day. You know what it said? It said, extincte nomine Christianorum, which means this, the na- hey, this is good. The name of Christ is extinct. You know why that's kind of exciting? Because the Roman Empire is no more. But you're sitting in church today because the name of Christ is not extinct. The name of Christ is lifted high. Uh, somebody said, are, are you worried about the future? I said, no, because my king's got a good track record and nothing's going to hinder him. Well, can I just do this? Um, what I notice is I just read about the trials of Paul, the storms Paul went through, all the mess that he suffered through. I noticed God used him greatly, like Luke would pause and say, whoa, whoa, this wasn't Paul. This was God working through Paul and nothing was gonna hinder the God. But listen, in order to be used greatly by God, you've gotta have some attitudes that God can use. Did that make sense? So let me give you, uh, I had 10, let me give you three. Um, You're welcome. I love you. It is so often when there's hindrances, when there's difficulty, that that's when God's going to use you. Hindrances in your workplace, hindrances in sharing the gospel, hindrances in your family. That every time you start to serve God, if you're truly serving God, there's going to be hindrances. What's your attitude going to be as you serve God? Well, just write these down real, real briefly here. Write down the word unhindered clarity. Unhindered clarity. This is what I notice about Paul as I read through those stories, as I listen to those Bible tapes. I noticed he always stayed focused on the message of Jesus Christ, him crucified and him raised. He never got off message. Acts 28, 31, it says this. Uh, it said, this is how Acts ends. He was preaching. What was he preaching? He was preaching the kingdom of God. And what was he teaching about? You looking at it? The Lord Jesus Christ. No pity party. Wouldn't you feel tempted to feel, I mean, if you went through all that, I almost think you have a right to feel slightly sorry for yourself. Take it from an expert complainer. But he's not. He's preaching the kingdom of God. 
means he says to them, you know, don't you, our great king at this moment is advancing his kingdom. And I might be in chains, but our God is pressing against the kingdom of darkness. He is at war with forces of evil. And at this moment, God is drawing his kingdom together, drawing his people together. And what God is preparing to do is climax all of history with a final coming. We call it the parousia. That's the kingdom of God. That's the preaching of the kingdom of God that we call people to Jesus Christ because time is short and any moment God is gonna call an end to history because everything's moving toward a final event and that final event is the coming of Jesus Christ. And there should be something, I'll try to, I won't say, uh, there, there should be something that wells up with joy in us to know that this is not all there is, but there is a coming king and at this moment I am part of his kingdom. And Paul locked up, looks up and goes, I'm gonna talk to you about Jesus. I'm not gonna get distracted by all, the, note look, look at verse 31, it's very clear, teaching about. And he uses three words there, the Lord, Jesus Christ. What did he talk about? The fact that Jesus is Lord. He's in charge. I might be locked up, but Jesus is Lord. This is specific, not just a God somewhere. I believe in Jesus. And I love that word Christos, Christ, Messiah. God has done what he promised to do. I just love the way that in trial, Paul said, I'm not going to get distracted from the gospel. Because that's what happens. Something bad happens to you in life. Things get difficult. You get distracted. And sometimes what you need is a crazy preacher in 29 Palms to say, put your eyes back on the gospel. Because we're so easily distracted. Amen? All right, you're like, what other points you got? Write this down. Your other points any better? No, they're awful. Um, I also notice you want an attitude that moves with God. You've got to have unhindered compassion. I notice that Paul is in these really difficult situations where many of us would be salty. And he just loves everybody around him everywhere he goes. Isn't that beautiful? Anywhere he goes, he's just loving people. I'm touched just by whatever trial he's in. He'll love the judge in the trial. He loves on the, on the, on the, the Romans themselves. He just keeps loving people. Can I put it this way? As I read over Acts, coming here to the end, as I read over Acts, I would say, Paul lived a life of strong love. Strong love would not be that he ever caved the gospel in for love, thus perverting love. But he always preached with boldness the gospel and loved everybody around him. He never gave up. And that was true on Lystra, when he got to Lystra. You're like, oh, I don't remember what happened on Lystra. They said he was a god. And then when he said, I'm not a God, they stoned him. And then he got up and walked right back in and said, that's love. Because I think if they stone you, that's the point you can um, say, I'm done here. I had good news, but you all can just rot in eternity. But they stone this guy and he gets up and walks back in the city to preach the gospel some more. That's love, that's strong love. That is unhindered. How easily are we thrown off from a, listen, somebody posts something you don't like on Facebook, you're like, all right, our, our love gets knocked, am I right? Our love gets knocked off easy. We went to Philippi, and they took him and beat him, threw him in jail, phenomenal earthquake. And Paul, in a great moment of leadership, I don't know how you do this, convinced the prisoners to stay in the prison, the prison guard comes out and he converts to Jesus Christ and it's beautiful. Why? Because Paul just loves him. Just loves him in that moment and shows him the face of Jesus. And it's beautiful. What, what Paul did a lot of time doing in that last missionary journey is he's going to the Gentile churches he started and he's taking an offering for the Jerusalem church because there's a famine in Jerusalem. And he's going church to church, place to place, where he's started these little churches, and he's saying to the Gentiles, it is about to get bad for the Jews. Could you give? And he just loves them so much. He's not afraid to, to ask them to, to give. I, mean, I didn't notice when he's in the storm with those sailors. Did you notice this? Sailors get out in a storm. Luke says, we lost all hope. You would think there'd be a little bit of temptation to antagonize sailors. 
Okay, some sailors, you are. Might want to pick up an application when we land somewhere. A shipwreck in Malta. And he doesn't get bitter or mean. It's bit by a snake and they misunderstand him. I just noticed this, that if you want to be used by God, you can never be thrown off of love's game plan. And it is easy. I say that to you because it is easy when life gets difficult to get calluses on your heart to forget why we're here. Because your coworkers are slightly annoying. And so you kind of feel like you've got a pass from them. The people around you on planet Earth, oh, wait, your family. Amen. Unless you're sitting by them, you're like, no, not my family. I, I hear you. We'll drive you, right? And we start thinking, I kind of, maybe I got permission. You don't have any permission. If Paul could love sailors in a storm who are supposed to take him to a prison, you can love your mother-in-law. Amen. And quiet in here. <laughs> yeah. You got any other points? Look, you got to move with clarity. You got to be clear that you're serving Jesus in this life. And you got to love the people around you. If you don't want to be, listen, that's a life that won't be hindered. But write this down also. You've got to have unhindered courage. It's going to take courage to move with Jesus. It is not easy to move with a God who's moving forward takes courage. Remember um, when he's in Jerusalem and there's that violent attack on him? And then he goes to the Jerusalem council and they violently attack him. This is Acts 23, verse 11. It says this. The following night, after he's been attacked by his own people. They're, they're planning to kill him. The following night, the Lord stood by him. This is beautiful to me. He has no one. He says, that night the Lord came and just stood by Paul. Is that beautiful? And he, the Lord starts talking. The following night, the Lord stood by Paul, stood by him and said, take courage. Take courage. Take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, you must also in Rome. You're going somewhere with a purpose. I, I, I love just some stuff out of that verse. I love that the Lord physically came and stood by him. You're not alone. And surely I'm with you all to the very end of the age. Wherever you go, I'm there with you. I kind of like that the Lord reminded him, you must preach about the facts. Christianity is not a dream, it's not a hope, it's not a religion, it's a fact. It is true reality. And I love the way that the Lord just kept him on mission. Don't get discouraged, Paul. I'm doing something. Um, what God wants to do in your life is God wants to use your life to advance his gospel. And he wants to do that in your workplace, he wants to do that in your town, your family. He wants to do it in your school. He wants to use your life, but it has to be a life of courage, a life of love, a life that speaks clearly about Jesus. Here's what would happen to Paul. He is locked up in a house. Do you think he'd be so discouraged? Poor me. Pity me. But he's like John Bunyan, or John Bunyan's like Paul. Lock him up. Can't preach anymore, Paul. It's okay, I'll start writing. You write Pilgrim's Progress, Paul? No, I wrote Ephesians while I was locked up. Kind of good book. Amen? Amen? Oh, hey, he didn't just write Ephesians. He wrote Philippians. And he wrote Philemon. And he, and, and he wrote Colossians. All these, like, like the, the, uh, the second half of Paul's letters are all written while he's in their house arrest in Rome. By the way, with a Roman guard looking over his shoulder as he's writing to the churches at Colossae. What are you writing? Oh, that's going to be good. Hold on. He is the, he, and he'll just start writing stuff. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That guard's looking. You think the guard got saved? As Paul writes all of this, this stuff, uh, Paul would write about his own imprisonment in Philippians chapter one. He would say this, he would say, don't think that what happened to me, don't feel sorry for me. Because what happened to me happened to serve the gospel. 
This is Philippians 1.13. He says, it has become known because I'm in prison. It has become known through the whole imperial guard that my imprisonment is for, for Christ. He goes, I have started having a brand new ministry. I used to go preach to Gentiles. They would stone me and I would go to the next place. Now I preach to Roman guards. And it has become, listen to it again. It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard that my imprisonment is for Christ. And what we know from history is those guards started getting saved. How do we know? Um, there is a barracks abs part of Caesar's palace. Uh, Caesar's palace in Rome, not Caesar. Anyway, um, there's a barracks. And that barracks, they have cut out a block. You can see it now in, in Rome. It has, is that up there? That is... Roman graffiti. Say, what is it? It is a donkey crucified. And the words under it say, Aximaeus worships his God. Now, here's how we know that Christianity was spreading through the prison guards, and in particular, the household of Caesar, because they were making fun of us. They were mocking. That is, that is not Christian worship. That is a mockery of the cross. That's calling, but the very facts that it would be mocked expresses how deeply it's being spread. Does that make sense? All of a sudden, this thing's going everywhere, and the other Romans are going, wait, 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 you worship what? A guy we crucified? Philippians 4.22 is wonderful to me. It says this. Paul wraps up Philippians. And listen, just listen. I'm, I, he says, all the saints greet you. That's especially those of Caesar's household. Yeah, isn't that great? I'll be excited for all of you. All the saints greet you. All right, I know the church at Rome and this guy and this guy. Oh, no, no, not just them. And over here in Caesar's household, I've been winning people. They're putting graffiti on the walls because of these people. These are the people that greet you. My imprisonment was never a hindrance to the gospel. In fact, my imprisonment has moved the gospel into the heart of Caesar's palace. Say, what, what happened to Paul? Can I just wrap up this way? And then I'll, I'll just give you time with the Lord. I say this to you, when you pray to your God, you pray to an unhindered God. And God wants you to move without hindrance. You have clarity in your life. I'm about Jesus, and you never be ashamed of that. And you love the people around you and share the gospel with them with courage. What happened to Paul? Uh, he was in Rome for two years, and his accusers never showed up. So he was released. We know that after that, he took the gospel to Spain, Crete, Nicopolis. An interesting thing happens in Nicopolis. He gets to Nicopolis about A.D. 66. At the same time that the emperor, Nero, goes to Nicopolis. Get it? Both arrive in Nicopolis at the same time. Um, Nero is there to participate in the Acacian Games. They were, um, what they did at the Acacian Games, when the emperor wants to play the game, let me help you, he wins. So they just rigged all the games so the emperor won and got all the crowns and you're so wonderful. But an interesting thing happens after that. Both Paul and Nero end up back in Rome at the same time, both coming from the same place. What a, what a lot of scholars think is that there was a personal confrontation between Paul and Nero and that Paul preached the gospel to him. It could go further and Nero's hate for Paul Maybe that he figures out, this is the guy. This is the guy that's been infiltrating my palace. This is the guy that's been talking Jesus nonstop. Nero's been looking for him, and they show up in the same town at the same time. Can you imagine it? Paul says, emperor. Everybody else is bowing down. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Jesus, I've had it with your Jesus. Bring him back to Rome with me. I don't know how all it went down, but I know this. Paul and Nero end up back in Rome at the same time. And Paul is thrown, not this time, in house arrest. 
he's thrown in the Maritime prison. But what is it? Today, it's all pretty. Back then, it was a hole in the ground. You take the prisoner. There's no staircase. They built a staircase, and they prettied it up. It's just like 60 feet from the Roman Senate. You take the prisoner and you just drop him into the hole. And the prisoner waits to die. And that's what happened to Paul. He wrote one last letter, 2 Timothy. He has swan song. You know what a swan song is? They say that before a a swan dies, it, it gives off a beautiful song. That's a lie, but that's what they say. 2 Timothy is his swan song. And he'd say this, he'd say, I have fought the fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. And he looks death in the eye, I'm ready. AD 67, Paul is executed by Emperor Nero. Uh, We know from Clement, Dionysius, Eusebius, Tertullian, that the manner of execution was beheading. And it was probably the same year, and some Christians say the same day that the Apostle Peter was crucified. Two heroes of the faith walk into heaven together. Can you imagine? Christian tradition is that when they brought Paul out to execute him, he broke free of his captors and ran to the executioner's block and laid down his head because he couldn't wait to see Jesus. He was so excited. Read this. This is, um, this is on Facebook. It might be the only good thing ever in the cesspool. But I love it. It says, Paul entered heaven to the cheers of those he martyred. Did you get it? Paul entered heaven to the cheers of Stephen, who he participated in killing. The people he persecuted, the people who lost their homes, converted as Paul walks into heaven, they start applauding because that's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the way that the gospel works. Um, He didn't give you time between you and the Lord. I ask you this, where is your witness hindered? Where is it that you need to show more love, more kindness, more patience? Some of you are like, I don't pray for patience. Because you think that like God's going to curse you if you pray. I prayed for patience and God goes, oh, now you're going to get it. Now you prayed for patience. I'm going to make bad. Look, the st- look life's going to happen anyway. You might as well ask for the patience. Who do you need to be more patient with, more loving toward? Who do you need to be clear? What context do you need to be clear with the gospel in? And then some of you just need to be at this altar praying. You've got a God that's not hindered by your problems. Aren't you glad? Because you slightly are. That's why they're problems. Hey, listen, because I won't remember at second service. So hold on, this is good. Every problem you have is not a problem to God. Amen? It's not like he's up there sweating your finances. I don't know what we're going to do. Ah, that's bad. You bring it to God. Let's give you time between you and God. Some of you need to get really clear about Jesus. And you've been kind of murky. And it's time that you made a clear decision to follow Jesus, to be baptized. Thank you for listening to the sermon. For further information or to get in contact with our church's ministries, please visit us at palmsbaptistchurch.com.